Father in heaven, thank you so much for the privilege of being able to sit here and for me to stand here and to sit under the word of God preached and heard. But Holy Spirit, we need you to come into this room, into this sanctuary, and and speak directly to us. Take the words that are coming out of my mouth and bring them into the hearts of these people. Otherwise, nothing will be of any use. You know the needs of this room more than I could ever imagine. And you know the things that are hurting and the places that need healing. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray that you now, even as I pray, begin that work of restoration. We pray, Lord, that you would focus our minds, Lord, for the next few minutes, that these words would leap out of these pages and into our hearts so that we would be rejoicing in what we have heard and what we have understood. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is one of my favorite places to be in Hebrews 11, because through it, um, we're looking at these heroes of faith. Okay, so Hebrews 11. We're only going to read one verse from this. Hebrews chapter 11. But I'm going to give you a little background and I'm going to read beginning from verse 29. But we're only going to look at one word today in, in, in all of Hebrews 11. But I'm going to read from verse 29, okay? So Hebrews chapter 11, verse 29, okay? By faith, the people of Israel crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a welcome, friendly welcome to the spies. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lion, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, women received back their dead by resurrection, some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with a sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves and on earth. All these though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Okay, so last week, we saw the amazing, unbelievable story about God bringing the Israelites to a place of complete weakness. Remember that? So that's from verse 29. God had saved the Israelites out of Egypt by a mighty hand. And the last plague that God strike the Egyptians with was the plague of killing all the firstborn of Egypt, both animal and man. If you're here for the first time, you got to read that. And it is just striking how shocking it is what God did. In the middle of the night, God sent his angel to go and kill all the firstborns of Egypt. Like I said last week, by rough estimates, the conservative estimates, there would have been probably three million people living in Egypt, apart from the two million Israelites. So you can just imagine how many firstborns fell that night. But not one of the, of the Israelites died because they had declared that they would stand on the side of God, on the side of Yahweh, by painting their door frames red with the blood of the Lamb. But 
What happened last week we saw was that God had taken them out of Egypt by a mighty hand and immediately God led them through a major detour to go south into the desert, into the wilderness, to force them into a dead end where they were surrounded by mountains and by water on either side and God told them, make your camp right here in front of the Red Sea and wait. Wait for the Egyptians to catch up to you so that I will get glory from the death of Pharaoh and his entire army. And we saw last week the unbelievable verse that God promised to the Israelites. Exodus 14, 14, God said, The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. We saw last week that the reason God does this the reason why God didn't allow the Egyptian, the Israelites, sorry, to walk directly east to the land of the Philistines, which was incidentally just a three day walk, was so that the Israelites would be forced into a place of complete weakness so that the power and the mercy of God would be displayed. God knew that the Israelites could not handle the easy and the fast way. If they had had an opportunity to escape, they, they would see the Philistines and then they would turn back and go back and serve Pharaoh and their gods. And God knew this. So for the mercy, for his mercy and his grace to be manifest in these Israelites, he forced them into the desert, cornered them, surrounded them by all these obstacles, and then said to them, be silent and know that I am God. And we saw the amazing thing that happened. The Red Sea was opened. The Israelites crossed as on dry land. And then when the Egyptians tried to do the same thing, God closed the water over them and all of Pharaoh's army died that day. And not one of the Israelites, not one of the two million Israelites were harmed. And that day, the scripture says, the Israelites began to fear and believe God and his servant and his servant Moses. God does it so that we would begin to believe in him. And I asked you last week to think back to your own walk of faith. If God hadn't cornered you, if God hadn't forced you to a place of complete destitution and brokenness and weakness, you would not cry out to him. That's just the fundamental nature of humans. I love what John Bloom, this writer, says about this. He says, the title of his article says, God doesn't need you to be strong. He just doesn't need you to be strong because He wants you to seek your strength in Him. God does not want us to be strong. Rather, He wants to be our strength. He says, the Israelites were trapped in a weak place, a place designed for them by God, because God wanted the Israelites to understand that He was their strength and He was their salvation. That's why He put them in a weak and helpless place. And He says this, listen. He says, the truth is, as sinful people, we would never really understand what it means for God to be our strength and our salvation unless we are put in a place of, in a place weak enough so that He becomes our only option. At first, when we are in these situations, it doesn't feel like great mercy. But later, and oftentimes much, much later, we discover that it was a true gift of, mer of mercy that God forced us into a dead end. And then, and only then, God really becomes our song that we sing. In Hebrews 11, we see this amazing trend here of people who have lived by faith, where God had brought them to this place of complete weakness, and then God shows himself totally strong. That's why he allows you to suffer. Because he wants you to finally turn to him. Because otherwise you wouldn't do so. But there's a really interesting here thing here about the Israelites. If you look at that story, it, it doesn't seem like they have much faith. They don't display much faith. In fact, they're terrified. 
In fact, they begin to sin. They begin to complain to Moses and complain to God, saying it would have been better for us to go serve the Egyptians and their gods rather than to die here in the wilderness. So it doesn't seem like there's much faith going on for these Israelites, but why is it that here in Hebrews 11, they are listed as one of the heroes of faith? Why is that? That's really interesting. And actually, if you read through the list of characters that we're going to study the next few weeks, I'm going to name some of them to you. Gideon, we're going to see him today. Barak, Samson, Jephthah. If you, if you know a little about these people, you know that in fact, they did not display a lot of faith. It's especially Samson, probably one of the worst characters in the Bible. And yet he is listed here. Along with Abraham and Noah and Abel. So why does the author do this? It seems to me that what the author is trying to say by, by juxtaposing these spiritual infants with these spiritual giants together in one chapter is this author's way of telling us that what the focus here, here in Hebrews 11 is not their faith. It's not the amount of their faith that is the focus. It's not whether their faith is great or whether their faith is small that is the focus. What the focus is on is on the content and the reason and the person in whom they have faith. The focus here is on God who is faithful, not on these people who have great or little faith. Because in fact, if you read the story that we're going to read today, it doesn't seem like Gideon has had great faith. And the reason why the focus is on, we know it's on God, is because chapter 12, verse 2, tells us that that's the focus. So we've got it easy here. Chapter 2, chapter 12, verse 2 says, Look to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of your faith. The focus is on Jesus, not on Abraham, not on Noah, not on Enoch. And the reason we're going to look into their life is to see that whether their faith was great or small is not the focus. It's on Jesus who authored their faith and who completes their faith. And in fact, frankly, I recognize myself more with the Israelites or with Gideon than I would ever do with Abraham. So today we're going to see just another amazing story from, 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 from the Old Testament found in Judges. But before we read that, one thing we did not read and we should have read last week, we saw Exodus 13 and 14 last week, but we didn't read Exodus 15. And we should have read it because what we see is that what happens when God leads them out of Egypt into the desert, the main thing that happens there in chapter 15 is that they begin to sing and to dance. They begin to worship. And the reason this was so important for us to read is because we need to remember why God saved the Israelites out of Egypt. Why did God free these two million people? Why did they bring him out into the desert? And if you remember the dialogue between Pharaoh and Moses, the only reason why God led them out was for them to worship God. That was the only reason. And the reason this is so important is we need to understand that God's ultimate purpose, God's ultimate reason for saving us or for saving the Israelites is so that we would worship. Salvation is not the ultimate goal. Forgiveness of sins is not the ultimate goal. Justification is not it. Sanctification is not it. Evangelism and spreading the gospel is not the ultimate goal of God because all of those things will one day come to an end. But the only thing that will last until eternity is the white-hot passion of your worship. Salvation is not the goal. Because one day, salvation will cease. You will be saved and you will be heaven. There will be no more work to save. 
Forgiveness is not the ultimate goal because one day all sins will have been forgiven and you will be in heaven with God. Evangelism will end because one day there will be no more possibility to enter the kingdom. But one thing will not end and that is the white hot passion of your worship. John Piper says this in his famous book, Let the Nations Be Glad. He says, Missions exists because worship doesn't. Worship will be eternal. Missions is temporal. Worship is ultimate. Missions are not. But think about this for a second. What is worship? The word English, the English word for worship, well, simply means ascribing worth or worthship. That's where the word comes from. But I looked all over for a great definition of worship, and there are some really good ones, but none of them, I feel, really get to the heart of it and some of them that are really good are just way too long for us to remember. So what is it? Okay, so I'm going to try to help you build your own definition, and I'm going to give you mine. But let me read you two things about worship, okay, both in the Old Testament. One of them comes from Deuteronomy 6. So God says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Okay? But listen to this from Isaiah 29. So Isaiah writes, These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on nothing more than human rules that have been taught. Do you hear that? Their lips praise me and honor me, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is merely human rules that have been taught. That's not worship. So singing and praising is not necessarily worship. So here's my attempt at a definition. And you can tell me if you think it's it's good. Worship is the natural response to that which your heart loves most. Let me Let me say it again. Worship or praise is the natural response that flows from what your heart loves. Or to put another way, that which your heart loves most, you will worship. And I say this because in Deuteronomy 6 it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and from your heart will flow ceaseless praise. And therefore, that which you love the most is that which you worship most intensely. And so your love of God is flowing out and manifested in your worship. And that's why Psalm 84 says this, How lovely are your dwelling places, O Lord my host! My soul longs and yearns for the courts of God and my heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. You see what's happening here? There's a yearning of the heart. There's a love and a desire for God and it manifests itself through singing. But it happens here. God had brought the Egyptians, God had brought the Egypt, the Israelites out of Egypt to worship. But what we see here today is that they did everything else but worship God. In fact, the moment they had a chance, they turned away to idols and they worshipped other people. So to see that, let's turn to Judges chapter 6. Okay, there's a, we're going to read a, a huge part of Judges this morning so that you get a good background story of what's happening here. This is several years after Moses had led the Israelites out of Egypt. God had commanded them to worship God, but the one thing they did again and again is worship idols. And so God allows the Israelites to go through this four cycle, four step cycle every generation again and again. It's the Israelites rebelling and then God rebuking and then the Israelites repenting and then God redeeming. Rebellion, rebuking, repentance, and then redemption. This cycle goes on and on and on again so that when we read Judges, we realize that 
Frankly, it seems as if Israel has no hope at all. But, but something happens, and I know that Daniel Fellowship is looking at Judges, so I'm really happy for this. Something happens throughout the book of Judges where it gives us these glimmers of hope of what could happen. I'm going to read some of these to you. Judges 3, right at the beginning. Judges 3, verse 10. It says, The Spirit of the Lord came, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Othniel, and he judged Israel. Okay. Then Judges chapter 6, 30, 34. The Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon, and he sounded the trumpet. Then four times from Judges 13 to 16, it says, The Spirit of the Lord rushed upon Samson. And he performed great works for the sake of Israel. Do you hear the pattern there? Peppered throughout the book of Judges in this terrible book where Israelites are just doing unbelievable things against God and to themselves. Peppered throughout this book are three major sections where you see God saying, the Spirit of the Lord came and saved Israel. In fact, Judges is a book that foreshadows the work of the Spirit. And it says that the only hope that we have is in the Spirit of God. That's the only hope. And so let's read from Judges 6, verse 1, and then we're going to read all the way to chapter 7, verse 23. I'm going to skip some parts, so follow closely along. Chapter 6, verse 1. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian overpowered Mid Israel, and because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves dens that are in the mountains and in the caves and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would camp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents and they would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted so that they laid waste the land as they came in. And Israel was brought very low because of Idion. And the people cried out for help to the Lord. When the people cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel, and he said to them, Thus says the Lord, God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizrite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and said to him, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, sir, if the Lord is really with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where has all his wonderful deeds that our father recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in the smite of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? And then he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in the, my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. And he said to him, If now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that is, it is you who speak with me. Please do not depart from me until I come to you and bring out my present and set it before you. And, he, and God said, or the Lord said, I will stay till you return. So Gideon went into this house and prepared a young goat and unleavened cakes from the ephah of flour. The meat he put on a basket and the broth he put in a pot 
and brought them to the Lord under the terebinth and presented them. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened cakes and put them on this rock and pour the broth over them. And he did so. And the angel of the Lord reached out the tip of his staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened cakes. And fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the eleven cakes. And the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. Then Gideon realized that he was the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord God said to him, Peace to be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is peace. To this day it still stands at Ophrah, which belongs to the Ezbris rites. That night the Lord said to Gideon, Take your father's bull and the second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the heads of the Oreb and Zeb, oh, sorry, the heads of the Asherah that is beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of the stronghold here, with stones laid in due order. Then take the second bull and offer it as a spurnt offering with the wood of the Asherah that you shall cut down. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord has told him, but because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. Now skip down to verse 33. Now all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of East came together and they crossed the Jordan and is camped in the valley of Jezreel. But the Lord, Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon, and he sounded the trumpet, and the Abizrites were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, and they too were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, and they went up to meet them. Then Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, Behold, I am laying a fleece of wool on the threshing hold. If there is dew or water on the fleece alone, and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. When he arose early next morning, and he squeezed the fleece, he wrung enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl with water. Then Gideon said to, the, to God, Let not your anger burn against me. Let me speak just once more. Please let me test you just once more with the fleece. Please let it be dry on the fleece only, and on the ground all around it let there be dew. And God did so that night, and it was dry on the fleece alone. And on all the ground there was dew. Then Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the spring of Herod. And the camp of Midian was north of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. The Lord said to Gideon, The people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into your hands, lest Israel boast over me, saying, My own hand has saved, oh, saved me. Now therefore proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. Then 22,000 of the people returned or left, and only 10,000 remained. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Take them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. And anyone of whom I say to you, This one shall go with you, shall go with you. And any one of you I say to you, this one shall not go with you, shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to God, Everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouth, was three hundred men. But all the rest of the people knelt down to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, with the three hundred men who lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand. And let all the other others go, every man to his home. So the people took provisions in their hands and their trumpets. And he sent 
all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, but retained the three hundred men. And the, th- and the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. That same night, the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have given it into your, la- into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Perah your servant, and you shall hear what they say, and afterward your hands shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down with Perah his servant to the outposts of the armed men who were in the camp. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the people of the east lay along the valley like locusts in abundance, and their camels with without number, as a sand that is on the seashore in abundance. When Gideon came, behold, a man was telling a dream to his comrade, and he said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and behold, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian and came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and turned it upside down so that the tent lay flat. And his comrade answered, This is no other than the sword of Gideon and the son of Joash, the man of Israel. God has given into the ha- his hand Midian and all the camp. As soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped. And he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hands. And he divided the 300 men into three companies and put trumpets into their hands of all of them and empty jars with torches inside the jars. And he said to them, Look at me and do likewise. When I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then blow the trumpets also on every side of the camp and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. I won't read the rest of the story because what happens next is simply just a recurrence of what God did for the Israelites back in the Exodus. When the Israelites came up to the camp, they blew their trumpets. Remember, they only have trumpets and torches in their hands. They don't even have a sword. And what God did was he caused there to be such confusion in the Midianite camp that they began to kill themselves. And the war was already won. I'm only going to make one observation about this. And it's about the way God works and the reason why God does this. You'll notice here again that the same thing God did to the Israelites at the Red Sea, God does to Gideon and his people here. God brings the Israelites to a place of complete weakness so that his power would be manifest. And trust me, these people were weak. You know, oftentimes we read the story of Gideon and there's two interpretations. There are people who either say he's a man of great faith and then say we should be like Gideon and ask of signs of God and have God gives us signs so that we would walk in his path. And then there are others who say that Gideon was such a man of such cowardly faith, such little faith, that he had to even test God twice, not even twice, but even three times, so that he would begin to follow. But like I said in the beginning, the point of this passage, and on any passage in the Bible really, is not the characters themselves, but the God who is behind these characters. This story is not about Gideon, whether his faith be strong or weak. The story is about the God behind him, who created faith in Gideon and who was patient in him to lead him to grow in faith. I mean, think about this. God chose the weakest family from the weakest clan and he chose the youngest person in that family. It just totally doesn't make sense that God would do that. And God said to him, I will be with you. And here, listen to these amazing words in verse 16 of chapter 6. He says, I will be with you, Gideon, and you will strike the Midianites as one person, as one man. God says, you will take on the entire army of the Midianites, and you only need to be one person. 
because I will be with you. Any guesses to how big the Midianite army was? A thousand? Two thousand? Well, the Israelite army, we know, was 32,000 at the beginning. So how big was the Midianite army? The, the answer is given to us in chapter 8, but I'll just tell you. Their army was 135,000 soldiers, not counting the horses and the donkeys and the camels. 135,000 against 30, 33,000, 32,000. And then God said, that's not weak enough. I will make you even weaker. Get rid of those people who are afraid. Have them go home. So 22,000 of them left. That's two-thirds of their army. If you're Gideon, you should be panicking now. How, how are you going to fight a war if 22,000 people from your army have just left? And God said, that's not weak enough. And he does this separation of this people through the drinking of water. And in the end, 300 people are left. Incidentally, they make a, they made a terrible parody of this, or they, they tried to copy this story by that movie 300, which just doesn't compare to this passage. But enough about that. Here, God chooses these 300 men who in fact are terrified. Right? Gideon, their leader, is terrified. Because it's going to be 300 people against 135,000. And if this isn't a suicide mission, well, I don't know what it is. And God says to Gideon, I know you're afraid. I just know it. I prepared you for this. I designed it for you to be trembling because tomorrow you're going to face 135,000 and all you've got are 300 terrified people. I know you're afraid. And he says to them, but I want you to go now to that camp and just listen to what I've put into the camp. And so God speaks through these people, these two Midianites, where they dream this dream of a piece of bread of all things, rolling down from the hill and crushing the Midianite army. And verse 15 is the climax of the entire story of Gideon. That's the climax. It's not the war. Verse 15 is the climax, so read it with me. As soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped. That was the point. The, the war is not the point. The bringing of the Israelites out of the slavery of Midianites, that's not the point. The point is God causes the whole nation of Israel to be weak enough so that they would fall on their knees to worship. That's the only thing that God cares about. That's the only thing that God wants is for His people to be worshiping Him. Notice the amazing thing that Gideon does after this act of worship. It just blows my mind. Verse 16. He divided the 300 men into three camps, okay? And then he put trumpets into the hands of all of them and then empty jars with torches inside the jars. And he said to them, tomorrow we're going to go fight this war with trumpets in one hand and an empty jar with a torch in the other. It, it, have you gone totally mad? that you would walk onto the battlefield, face 135,000 people with a trumpet? You know, right here, this is where Gideon's faith is at its highest. In fact, actually, after the war, you begin to see Gideon begin to sin in different regard, but this is the height of his spiritual life. Because he realizes here, Gideon realizes here, that the only weapon he has against the enemy is his act of spiritual worship. That's the only weapon he has. And it's the only weapon that he needs to fight this war. Therefore, he brings into the battlefield instruments of worship, right? It's a trumpet. 
It's not going to kill anybody. It's a trumpet to worship God and to announce to the whole world that God is the one who is going to fight on their behalf. And so God causes these people to worship their way into victory. And this is the only thing that God wanted from the Israelites. Remember what I said at the beginning. The ultimate purpose of salvation is for there to be white, hot worship in you. And in fact, this passage tells us a really important truth that's, that's repeated in the New Testament, is that the only weapon you have against Satan is your white, hot worship. In fact, the only weapon that you can have is your prayer and your meditation and your singing and your silence done in worship. In fact, the temperature of your worship, the degree to which you worship, the intensity of your worship will determine how much victory you have over temptation. It has nothing to do with how loud you sing, with how high you raise your hands when you sing, with how much Bible knowledge you have. The temperature and the, the, the intensity of your worship is measured by the humility of your heart and by the joy of your heart finding satisfaction in God. Re- recall the definition that I offered, that worship Worship is the natural response that flows from that which you love most. And therefore, when Gideon, he saw the mercy of God displayed for him and for his people, he, that natural response flowed out from him and he worshiped. And then he turned around and he led his entire army to say, Let's worship our way into victory. Bible studies are not ultimate. Serving and sacrificing yourself for the sake of the gospel is not ultimate. Worship is. Evangelism is not the ultimate goal. Worship is. And Satan, he wants so much to deceive you to forget the ultimate reason and just settle for these penultimate things. Settle for just Bible studies. Settle for just memorizing scripture. Settle for just serving the church and serving the society and doing a lot of great works. Just stop there. That's what Satan wants you to do. Because he wants to strip you of that passionate, white-hot worship that only comes from loving God. So many churches, they serve God, they serve the church, they study the Bible fervently, but there is no passion for worship. The world sees this, and there's nothing that they want from that. But what God wants for us and for His church is that we experience the ultimate things, the excellent things, and not settle for these penultimate things. Things. I'm going to read you what this, what this famous writer says about this. John Frame. Redemption is only the means. Worship is the goal. In one sense, worship is the whole point of everything. The worship is the whole point of your whole life. It's the purpose of history. It's the purpose of the whole Christian story. Worship isn't just one segment of the Christian life that's done on Sunday mornings. Worship is the entire Christian life. When we meet together as a church, our time of worship is not just a, a icebreaker for something else. Rather, it is the whole point of your existence. Let me end with this. God knows that you can't worship Him in full-blown passion. And therefore, what he will do, and what he did with the Israelites and with the people of Gideon, is that he will bring you to a place weak enough, desperate enough, powerless enough, 
so that for the first time in your life, perhaps, you will respond naturally with worship when you see His mercies and His grace. You might be in that place right now where you can't understand why God is not responding to your prayers, why God is keeping you in this place of perhaps depression, where God is perhaps keeping you in the state of constant discomfort and restlessness. And know this, that God did that, is doing that, and will continue to do that because He is merciful to you. Because He wants to create worship out of you. He wants your lips to match your heart. And He wants your mind to fo- set so much focus on God so that in the midst of these things, you can sing and you can praise. God knows that you're a spiritual infant, that you need sustenance, and therefore He corners you into these places in your life to do that. And the very thing that He does to us, He did to His own Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Himself was once a spiritual infant. He had to learn the Word of God. He had to learn to fear God. He had to learn to trust God. And he, God brought Jesus into the same places of weakness that we experience so that God would be magnified through him. And in fact, listen to this, the most decisive blow that Jesus gave to Satan was through his final and most beautiful act of worship. Just like Gideon destroyed Midianites, Jesus destroyed the work of Satan with the most beautiful act of worship. When Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. That was the most beautiful act of worship in all history. And that was the greatest blow to destroy the work of Satan. And Jesus died at that very moment in a place of His greatest weakness and desperation. And at that one point of greatest desperation and weakness, He also uttered the words of greatest worship. Did you see that? That God led Him to that point on that cross so that He would utter from His lips the most beautiful words of worship. Into your hands I commit my spirit Paul says this about that. Brothers, by the mercies of God, I beseech you to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. Well, God will do that for you. He will lead you to these places of of brokenness and of desperation so that you will utter the same words as Jesus saying to him, Father, Into your hands I commit my life. I know you want that. That's what you're here for. You're not here to waste your time listening just the words and forgetting them tomorrow. You're here to see that God will work in you ultimate things so that you would finally begin to have your heart sing and praise Him with all your heart with all your mind, and with all your strength. Let's pray. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up and prepare to lead us into worship again. But before that, I just want to give you a minute to say to God, Just help me, Father. Do whatever it will take to bring me to worship you. Father in heaven, your people are praying now. And I know that so many of them, they just, they want so much to be authentic in their worship to be genuine in their worship, 
to sing with passion. And, and there are just so many things, the worries of this world, the cares of this world, that hold them back. And Father, I just pray that you have mercy in our church, that you bring us to this place of weakness that we need to be in so that we would respond, we would respond in praise. Do whatever it takes, Father, for that is your greatest act of mercy. What you did to your Son, we ask you do to us. We ask this in your Son's precious name. Amen.